is, well, there you have it. Um, by which I mean zero training. These are not neural networks of any kind that you're used to. Uh, there are actually little models in the dictionary sense of brain circuits. And what, what we do is we build a model and uh, of a bunch of interacting systems in the brain, um, and we uh, run it on stimuli, just like the non-human primate sitting over there, and we just walk, let the two separately run, and then we compare the results when we're done, uh, which is, again, em emphatically not what any neural network system that you know of uh, does. Um, and by the way, when I say something emphatic, that's an invitation to uh, call me out and ask a question. So please, yeah. right. yes. So what's the difference between this and the algorithm? Well, this is, this is an algorithm. Everything, I mean, what it's doing is it's not, so what artificial neural networks, a great question, what, what artificial neural networks are doing are taking the data from some experiment, you know, and a, a, a person or a non-human primate or something running on a bunch of visual cues, I'm gonna show you. Um, and then taking that data and essentially generalizing and learning that data so that it then produces the same kinds of things that the subject produced. This is not doing that. This has no input of any data from the experiment. All it does is it, it does the same thing, the purportedly the same thing that the, that the monkey is doing, uh, looking at these images, computing something, and making decisions, I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna go through all this. I'm, I'm doing it, I'm, you know, it's, it's all preview now. Uh, I'm gonna, but uh, uh, running through all those internal computations based on hypotheses of what those brain circuits are doing in the monkey. And it's simply gonna run those, build up things with synaptic plasticity, and then read them out via decision-making because it's gonna see something it has to say, was that in category A or category B? And I have to push a button. That's what the simulation does. And the simulation has never seen the monkey, never seen any of the monkey's data, never seen anything. It just runs. That's the sense in which it's not at all like something that trains on data. It's not doing any any form of data analysis. We do we do the data analysis on the simulation output afterwards. Um, and the 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 take home is going to be that part of the take home is there's no training on data. The rest of it is. The simulation shows up with certain kinds of behaviors after it's learned. And it, it, when, when, when we look at what it's done, I'm going to show you all these. Uh, and we say, oh, the, the, these particular cell types in uh, superficial uh, anterior cortex, this particular uh, cortical area, are showing this funny encoding. They're uh, early warnings for uh, mistakes that are going to be made later. And we're like, oh, that's an interesting thing for the simulation to do. But then we looked at the monkey. Turns out the monkey did it. And nobody had suspected it, which mean, which is another way of uh, not so politely saying that the simulation made a discovery, um, not a uh, not an assimilation of existing data, but rather a discovery uh, of the de novo encoding that we hadn't known about. And again, I'm going to say all these things again. <laughs> Can't get rid of me. Uh, all this work was done by one guy, Anand Pathak, uh, at the head of the list there. Um, and uh, I'm just window dressing the rest of these people even less so. Um, the uh, uh, Anand has built this system and done uh, the analysis, et cetera, et cetera. Um, most of the data, all, all of the data that we then compare against after the fact is from uh, Earl Miller's lab at uh, MIT. And uh, in fact, these guys are uh, collaborators and fantastic collaborators. Um, uh, oh, and we'll have put an emphasis on discovery. Quick take home points, um, which I'll come back to at the end. Um, we're going to run through a complex behavioral learning task and a bunch of physiology that comes from elect implanted electrodes in the monkey while they're doing the task. Um, the task entails uh, the simulation sees a picture. I'm going to show you the pictures. It categorizes, it learns, learns to categorize, which you can't do at the outset. Um, and there's a bunch of kind of learning that uh, that we're gonna uh, detail as we go through. It has a little working memory period where it has to uh, hold uh, active uh, information while it's 
waiting for an okay to make a decision. Then it does decision making and it literally chooses, this is all the simulation. And then it chooses uh, a button to indicate which category the, uh, the image was. While all that's going on, all that's happening is a bunch of spiking and field potentials. Uh, and so we're going to look at those and we're going to see that there are rhythms in that spiking. There are phase locking between areas, uh, across areas in the simulation, which I'm going to show you. Um, there's sometimes synchrony, there's sometimes out of phase uh, behavior. Uh, and we're looking at predominantly a big corticostriatal circuit, which has a bunch of parts. But uh, by and large, the uh, uh, relations between who's doing the heavy lifting in cortex, who's doing it in striatum is something that will emerge from this thing. And by the way, as I will keep on emphasizing because, because hey, it's a big old take home uh, message, um, there is full on actual discovery. And you know, you know, that never happens, that discovery thing. So I do wanna keep emphasizing it. So again, the thing I started the, uh, uh, with uh, a few minutes ago, how is it that circuit activity physiology translates to uh, behavior? So I'm going to show you direct production of behavior from this biological model trained on nothing. Um, the model activity is then, after the fact, identified directly or compared side by side to the non-human primate data. Uh, and we are hoping, future thing that I'm just putting in for because I'm gonna talk about it later, that uh, this is telling us something about the direct link between physiology and cognition. Not modeling of physiological data during cognition, but the physiology actually producing the cognition. And therefore, when things go wrong with that, uh, it's possible that we will be able to uh, assist in a way in certain kinds of diagnostics. And that's what a lot of this uh, collaboration has, has been about. Uh, outline. I'm going to tell you about the experiment model, more model. Then I'm going to tell you about the side-by-side -side comparisons between the uh, simulation and the uh, monkey. Then I'm going to show you the predictions, the, the novel discoveries, and then quick wrap up. So I'm going to, a lot of this is going to be flyover. I'm going to quickly, quickly show you certain th things. And then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on some of the very specifics that I think are useful to look in more depth at. Um, all of this is, by the way, written up. Um, so all the details that I skip here, you can see them all in uh, a paper that's not published, but it's but it's on BioArchive. Um, we're aiming to publish it, just haven't done it yet. Um, okay, monkey looks at picture. So what are these pictures? These uh, little dot patterns. These are standard classic dot patterns from uh, by, you know Michael Posner back in the early 1800s. Okay, that was a joke. Sorry, Mike. Um, but long, long, long time ago when uh, he developed these things. And uh, what the monkey sees are these kinds of pictures. And these are exemplars of a hidden prototype that the monkey never sees. So he's never seen this, uh, this prototype. He only sees these things. And then he sees examples over here of a different prototype and exemplars that are distortions of that prototype. And he, the, the monkey is now tasked with trying to predict which exemplars come from which prototype. Why does he want to know? Because then he pushes a button saying it was prototype A, or prototype B. That's it. So he's learning to see from these distortions to figure out what is the prototype. There, so that's the entire task. And while he's doing it, I'm going to show you the walkthrough of the task. He's got to see it, then he's got to wait, then he's got to make the choice, the button choice. Um, but there are a bunch of variables in this task and we'll talk briefly about them. Um, you can see that there's a radius of difference, distortion between the prototype that's hidden versus the things that we show the monkey. I can make that a smaller set of distortions so that the exemplars look more like the prototype itself, or I can make them uh, expand as they look less like the prototype, et cetera. So we, we have a, a range of uh, experiments that are done with these monkeys, again, in uh, Earl Miller's lab um, at uh, MIT. Here's the way the experiment goes. Um, we show the monkey one of these uh, exemplars. So first he fixates, looking at the thing. Uh, then he um, is 
seeing the dot pattern and that's only for 600 milliseconds. Then it goes off. He's got to wait. He's been trained. He's been trained on hundreds of trials to uh, uh, wait now that he's seen the exemplar. And then when the uh, green dots come on, he's got a saccade left or saccade right to tell us which category he thinks it's in. Got it? Got the whole task. Okay. Um, at the beginning, these are just blocks way, way over, over trials and trials and trials. Each one of these is a trial. And these are blocks of trials. He starts off a chance, quickly climbs up to uh, doing very well. Then we change up to new prototypes and he drops down again, and learns it again. New prototypes, drops down again, uh, goes up again. And eventually he's got this. He knows he's got the, what, what, what he's sometimes called the learning set. Um, he knows that this is the task. The prototypes are going to change. It's my job to figure out what the prototypes are from the exemplars. Got it? So I'm just going to refer to these, you know, generically as early, middle, and late trials because I'm going to show you different physiology that, that goes on when the animal's doing this struggling early part versus when he's got it down. Okay, that's the experimental background. Here's the beginnings of the model construction. I'm going to quickly talk you through just the talking points, if you will. We take circuit operations. All of this is because I say that, that the network is not built from data. It's not doing what an artificial neural network does. What it is, is it's taking anatomical neuron layouts with physiological activity patterns that are computationally stuck into them. And there's a whole bunch of these. There are cortical pieces, there are superficial and deep cortical pieces, there are striatal pieces. Uh, 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 median spiny neurons in matrix, median spiny neurons in uh, patch. There's, I was, I'm going to show you loads of loads of these things. So there's all these different brain areas, and every single one of them has these anatomically uh, based neurons that are doing physiological uh, activity straight out of the literature. That's it. Again, nothing about this task, nothing about these monkeys. Got it? So uh, people often talk about little groups of neurons as assemblies. These are all assemblies. The difference here is that these assemblies all do something and we can characterize what they do. So I'm gonna spend quite a bit, of, well, I'm gonna spend several slides a little bit later on on uh, lateral inhibition circuits in cortex because they're very well understood both anatomically and physiologically. And it, they carry out a really interesting set of computations. Uh, that we can uh, that we can really nail very clearly. Uh, and again, this has all been published uh, previously. All, a lot of this is previous work. Uh, but they're also central pattern generators. Again, very well understood, or somewhat well understood. Uh, there's action selection in uh, the striatum, somewhat well understood. There's tonic activity also in the striatum, et cetera, okay? Um, now we characterize these guys by their physiology and their computations. I'm going to show you examples. We then compose these. We build them back up. They start off as little assemblies. We build them back up into big circuits and then connect those circuits, like a, this cortical circuit, this striatal circuit. We have them talking to each other. Um, none of them are trained on any data. Don't know how many times to say it. I'll keep saying it. Um, you'll be sick of me. It'll, I, I, I can guarantee. Um, so... Uh, and then all we do is it's not trained on anything. The model just runs on the same task that the monkeys are running on. And then we compare them side by side. Is this as though this works an experimental animal? This was an experimental animal, which it is. And then we compare them side by side. Key findings. The model learns. I wouldn't be here if it didn't. Um, and it's doing these complex decision making tasks. It's doing the internal categorization all through synaptic plasticity. Um, we, by looking at it, can identify causative relations. And I always say that with trepidation because there's nothing more, more uh, squirrely than causation in brain circuits. Uh, uh, and yet in this case, we're able to literally investigate cell by cell, uh, uh, spike by spike, what the pretend brain, what the simulation was actually doing. And so we're only talking about causation in the model, not necessarily in the non-human primate, but we'll see. Uh, one of the, again, key findings is this discovery of a particular encoding. It's gonna be, uh, I, I told you it was an early warning sign where neurons early, early on in the trial 
fire selectively when the monkey is about to do uh, the wrong thing, when he's about to push the wrong button in response to this image. So we call them bad idea neurons. These occurred in the simulation, and only later did we discover that they also occurred in the monkey. Here's a quick flyover of some example contents of the model. Simple Hodgkin-Huxley neurons, um, although uh, we also have done simple, much, much simpler integrate and fire neurons. We've also done more complex pinsky renzel neurons, um, by which I mean to convey this does not depend on the kind of neuron model that you're using. Um, all of these models, uh, integrate and fire, pinsky renzel uh, uh, single compartment, multi-compartment models, they're all doing the things that I'm going to show you today. Now, you have to dig to find them, to, to get them doing different things from each other. That is to get a Hodgkin-Huxley to do something for a, differently from a Pinsky-Renzel. And again, the, the neurons are doing different things if it's one model versus the other. But the network, very, very, very much the same thing. Please. So explain a little bit about the patterns. So Absolutely. Also, how the pattern get in? It's a visual pattern for the monkey to get it in. That's a great question. I'm going to show you in about, so I'm going to go through these quick physiological things first, and then I'm going to show you some of the anatomy, and then I'm going to build it up to that size of model. Then we'll go through it piece by piece, if that's if if, if that's okay to wait. Yeah. No, that's a great, great question. Both of these are. Um, right, right. I, I, and I get that I'm, I, I'm doing this. I, I wish I could give this talk such that I give you all of that all at once, um, but I'm encumbered by the seriality of language. Um, and I can only say one thing at a time. So um, I, I, I will show you. Um, the answer is there is both. And what I mean by that, I'll show you, is that um, when the input comes in, it starts of course with bottom-up activity, but it's then projecting to these anterior cortical simulated areas, which then project backwards. So you can very readily call, I mean, that's a standard thing to call on the one hand bottom up versus on the other hand top down. And I'll, I'll show you examples. Yeah. Um, right. Here's one. So up here, uh, I, I here's a uh, specific, I, I called this out earlier, um, and now I'm going to go through it in some detail. Um, a uh, uh, Within cortex, uh, lateral inhibition assembly. These are four cortical excitatory cells. This is a cortical inhibitory cell, um, a lot like a basket. And you can see that the uh, these guys are densely connected to each other. The inputs from some upstream cortical area are uh, uh, very sparsely connected to their excitatory targets, see me? And here's what's gonna happen. First thing, a spatial pattern of, of excitation arrives on just say these three axons. And let's say that that's, uh, you know, some picture of something, right? And all it is is, okay, here are these uh, uh, axons from the visual cortex that are now projecting in from visual way back to uh, prefrontal. Um, what happens? Well, there's some physiological ramp up. There's uh, the beginnings of a, a excitatory postsynaptic potential. You can see it right down here, yeah? And you can see that this one has, that there's a large slope on this, there's a lesser slope on this, even a lesser slope on this. Why is that? Because look at the, where the activity is, the axons, versus where those axons make contact with these cells via synapses. So this one happens, this cell, and of course we, you know, this cartoon was made for this, um, has three active uh, axons and uh, all of them make synapses onto this sparsely connected cell, got it? This one, only two of them are connected. This one, only one. This one, none. See it? And in general, with sparsely connected networks, it's always going to be the case that there will be a distribution of who gets uh, connected best to some particular input. This is very standard. The, no, ah, ah, I'm going to, I, I forgot to give the, uh, the disclaimer at the outset. I'm going to say some controversial things. This ain't one of them. Okay, nothing here is controversial. Everything here is just sheer uh, anatomy and physiology, very well understood, loads and loads of papers, not just from our lab, from lots of labs, 
on on this kind of uh, uh, setup in among uh, uh, close little assemblies of cortical cells. So what happens? Because this guy's ramping up fast, that means the voltage inside him, and here's this little, you know, funny battery looking cartoon thing. He gets up to spiking threshold, right? Just by this guy, this input coming in, he gets up to spiking threshold. Does this guy make it? He makes it two thirds of the way. This guy makes it even less. Once this, okay, so that's panel B. Oh, I think I have, yeah, there we go, panel B. Um, once he, once this guy gets to spike, look what happens. His output, act, and any all of their outputs, densely connect with their local inhibitory cell. That inhibitory cell, in turn, densely connects with all these excitatory cells and turns them all off. Literally just in, um, inhibits them. Um, and that could be, there's a bunch of ways that can happen. There's, we're going to talk a lot about different forms of inhibition as I, as I go forward. Um, but... Uh, again, this is known. This is very well observed in real tissue. This is, is a, it's a very real thing, even though this is just a cartoon. And so now all of them are ramped way back down in voltage. Um, they're hyperpolarized again. But notice, this is the only guy that had time to spike. See him? That is always going to be the case. There's going to be certain ones that are very well connected, synaptically connected to their inputs. They're going to spike first and everybody else is gonna be inhibited. And this guy is also gonna be inhibited, the guy who activated the inhibitory cell in the first place. And what you end up with is just these uh, uh, little EPSPs with no spikes, but a spike from this guy. That's lateral inhibition. And it's also, as you notice, a competitive network. These cells are competing to respond. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Sorry, what have I fucked up? Uh, bottom left. Oh, actually, right. Yeah, I wanted to catch it. Yeah. So what he's what uh, what he's saying quite correctly is that I shouldn't be showing this ramp down yet. Um, all I all I wanted to show is that this spikes, and I. But the better way to do it, I think, would be just not to show any of it and just say, um, look, in the you know in this moment, right after this spike the uh, inhibitory cells activated. And now all of them get pulled down. Make sense? Yeah, good, yes. So, you know, like I did, like I'm getting power, so I got to three and then I spike, and then uh, that's why in the top right, that's the two. So can it be the inhibition, can it be like just plus two, one, is plus two, or is it? It is, and I'm not showing that, you're right, inside the little, the, the cell body. Um, again, just a cartoon, it's, it leaves a lot to be desired. But um, I'm going to show you a real quick simulation with no inhibition. But yes, what's what's happening is because this uh, because this uh, inhibition has now stopped this guy, he can't climb any further. His voltage can't climb any further. And so yes, I should show these actually becoming less. Absolutely correct. Good. Thank you. Okay. I know you're getting it when you keep correcting my slides. Um, so. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, good. So we sometimes are going to make little uh, simplified icons just to, to, to show where these things occur in the larger model. Um, and by the way, there's a whole bunch of math. This is all uh, published as well. And there's a bunch of math and timing to this um, and ways of estimating what the probability of uh, uh, particular cell spiking is in a particular assembly, depending on its connectivity. So there's a bunch of ways, you know, there's a bunch of uh, computation you could throw at this. Um, oh yeah, this is just a simple, uh, you know, again, initial picture of here's that group of cells, or no, it's a group of, now we've got eight cells plus one local inhibitory cell, and they fire a lot on, uh, 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 if you don't have the lateral inhibition back from the inhibitory cell to the excitatory cells. And as soon as you do, you could see the uh, a sparseness of activity that suddenly emerges from that network. It's picking just those competitive winners. Sometimes these guys are called winner-take-alls um, in a simplified form. Okay, cortical plasticity. Now I'm gonna fly over several other uh, uh, parts just because I wanna, because there's a lot. Um, so we've got a, a induction of long-term potentiation. We've got a method of reversing long-term potentiation. These are all out of a very, very extensive literature. 
Um, yes, uh, uh, from uh, yeah, many, many, many different labs. Um, we've got a different kind of so that's one, two kinds of plasticity. We've got a different, completely, completely different kind of uh, plasticity rules in the striatum. That this one was in cortex. Um, in the striatum, it's a very different set of rules. They're completely different cell types. The medium spiny neurons are not anything like, uh, they're not anything like cortical cells. I mean, among other things, they're GABAergic. I mean, they're just completely wildly, wildly different. Um, so we've got a different set of learning rules. And all these are just taken out of extensive literatures. So we don't mean for any of these to be controversial. These are meant to just be uh, 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 refer referring to uh, a, a large existing uh, literatures. Um, we also have an ascending system. And again, big, big, huge literatures on these, um, both containing uh, uh, modulatory types of, neuro uh, uh, types of neurons with different chemistries, neither glutamate nor GABA, but also almost always a GABA cell that's in that loop, sometimes a GABA cell that's in a uh, self-inhibiting loop. Um, and so we are, are, are taking, the, by and large, we're simply using Wilson-Cowan uh, uh, versions of these, but we've done some Janssen Ritz. Um, what do the circuits look like? All that was physiology. The anatomy is, okay, these things are hooked up in a particular way. This is actually, a, again, a bunch of things in the literature on hypergeometric con connectivity. That means what are the probabilities of any given axon contacting any given, any given dendrite? And what are the probabilities of any given dendrite being contacted by any given axon? Put those two things together, you have a distribution called the hypergeometric. Uh, 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 published papers on this, and I can, any of these questions, please jot them down, and I can send you publications on all these. Um, uh, you can also ask questions. That's, that's fine. <laughs> of course, I didn't mean to stop you. Oh, yeah. You take it for consultation to help yourself? Absolutely. Okay. So at a different, uh, let me see if I have a picture. I do later. Um, so within a, a close region, the probabilities are relatively high that a particular cell will contact another particular cell. And when I say high, I mean around 0 0.1. Um, and when they're further away in the brain, the probabilities drop precipitously. Uh, and again, this is all numbers. None of these numbers are perfectly well known at all. Those of you who follow this kind of thing will know that we're, so we're just trying to take consensus numbers of a sort. All of them have arguments about them, but we're trying to take them out of the literature. And we've tested a bunch of the, a bunch of different numbers, just like we tested different kinds of cells. I said, we did integrated fires and Hodgkin-Huxley and Pinstein and cells. We, we're doing the same thing with these uh, connectivity uh, 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 probabilities and show, I, I'm not going to show you today, but we in the paper, we show you how the thing runs differently as you change those parameters. A lot of the network is very insensitive to a big range of these parameters. And then there are some things where the, the thing is very sensitive to certain ranges of parameters, which is a form of uh, hypothesis or prediction, if you will. It's, it's saying, we got to look for the to, to refine those connectivity numbers, for instance, because if they don't conform to what the model's doing, then the model's clearly doing something wrong and has to be corrected. Yeah. The next question about the numbers. So that four uh, circuitry and one in between is like the eighty twenty rule kind of thing, and other in between kind of thing. Everything else. Good. Good. In uh, superficial layer two tree of, of cortex which is what that picture is meant to be, um, you've got uh, pretty much a four to one or five to one ratio of excitatory cells to inhibitory cells. So it's literally just like that drug chain. And they are very, very densely feed-forward and feedback connected. That is, all the excitatory cells will activate that inhibitory cell. That inhibitory cell will activate all the excitatory cells within these neighborhoods. The radius of axonal arborization from that inhibitory cell only spreads a little bit beyond that group. After that, he can't inhibit anybody further away. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, very good questions. So we're using all that anatomy, again, straight out of the literature. Oh, uh, okay, now I'm going to really fly over. Uh, striatal uh, uh, medium spiny neurons and lateral inhibition of these. Um, ascending modulation on inhibition, which I briefly mentioned. Um, 
uh, tonically active neurons, which are the uh, cholinergic neurons in the striatal complex um, that are doing some uh, a, a particular form of pacemaking, um, but their their pacemaking is stopped by particular kinds of inputs. Just to show you that each behind each of these cartoons, there's several slides of this kind, which is meant to be a scare slide for now. Um, that say, uh, uh, here are all the MSNs, here's the tonically active neurons, here are the set of connectivities. Look at this little spot here where they, uh, the medium spinal neurons have the weirdest spines in the brain. They, they, uh, the inputs from dopaminergic, glutamatergic, and uh, cholinergic inputs all converge onto a single spine in a medium spinal neuron. And we're showing that here. Um, and again, nothing controversial at all about that. That's all very well known, very well studied. Um, and we're just taking it straight out of the literature. And then we simulate in the simulation, what is it that happens during learning while the animal is trying things? Um, which I'm, again, I'm gonna come back to that kind of thing later. And just to note, there are lots more of these. Okay, let's put them all together. Here's the question that you were asking earlier. What about the damn thalamus? Um, so yeah. We are, again, all, all of this is cartoons until we get to data, which we're going to do right after these, the next three slides go straight to data. So we have a stimulus. It comes in through these visual early uh, regions. It projects uh, uh, anteriorly to uh, prefrontal areas, um, agranular areas. Um, the cortex activates the medium spinal neurons. The Medium spiny neurons activate uh, the substantia nigra pars compacta, plus a whole bunch of subthalamic and uh, palatal uh, regions. The palatal regions output both to motor, downstream motor areas, which uh, among other things are carrying out the saccade that the animal does, um, but also back to thalamus and all the way back up to, to cortex. We take, so, you can't just magically, this was your question, you can't just magically take some visual image and somehow stuff it through all these wires and it, you know, get it intact to the thalamus. No such thing happens. Um, the, the details of this image are lost early, early on in this process. And all you've got is some interior uh, uh, encodings of what, uh, so in the visual regions, you've got a pretty good solid encoding of uh, the stimulus. But up here, you've only got a very uh, weird abstract encoding of what that visual image is. Down here, you got absolutely none of that. Um, uh, among other things, you've got uh, uh, you know a, a fan in from a larger cortex to smaller uh, striatal complex. Then you've got enormous fan in down to the uh, globus pallidus. Then you've got uh, uh, about the same size projection over to the thalamus and it then fans out back up to cortex. So you're losing an enormous amount of information. We are not pretending to keep that information in any, again, these are not neural networks of any kind that we're used to. These are simply actual estimates of what these areas do, how they're wired up, how many axons there are, uh, 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 and, and so on. So that it's only the kinds of signals that could actually get through to the pallidum and only the kinds of signals that could actually get through to thalamus. And we can look at these in by you know sticking a pretend electrode into the uh, uh, simulation. Good. All right. Uh, so we have actually built both. I didn't show it in this. Um, so there is the, let me go back. Um, there is the uh, 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 descending, look right here, cortex all the way, the pyramidal tract. That's the, the, the line you're asking about. Yeah. And we do have that. Uh, the results I'm going to show you are all driven by the uh, pallidum. Um, but we've run it both ways, and we get very, very similar results, uh, which is weird um, in a way, uh, uh, because of course, I mean, it's, a, it's an evolution question thing. It's in 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 big enough brains, um, you've got very little of that palatal to motor output pathway, and a lot of uh, pyramidal tract. Um, so in in humans, it's almost all that way. Uh, uh, macaques, which are the experimental animals, I'm going to show you. Um, Less so. Um, as soon as you get down to most uh, experimental animals, most mammals, um, a lot more of it is pallidum and very little of it is pyramidal tract. Just so, yes, we're cognizant of that and we do uh, uh, model it in, in different brain sizes. You want to explain it to your 
Ah, uh, no, we have actually, so over here, we've got, um, no, good question. We've got a, a generic cartoon brainstem area. We actually, that's a lie, um, in the model, we actually have several of these and they are pacemaking at very, very different rates. Um, so a bunch of hypothalamic areas that are pacemaking at very different rates. I'm gonna show you some examples of, of what those look like. We actually have no superchiasmatic in this one. Question. What's that uh, bone region still represent by like, some of the nuclei? Which, which one? When you have like the polypolyp uh, which region does the like bone the represent? Good, good, good. So um, yeah, this is actually um, there are several, and I'm showing it's a cartoon, and I apologize, I can't. So the uh, 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 ventrolateral areas are present because they are projecting from. Uh, motor areas back up to motor areas. Um, so we're looking at several of these. I should say, I've taken, <laughs> I've taken the liberty of saying how extensively physiological and anatomical many of these structures are. Then there are some that are really barely cartoon sketches. And our entire thalamus, just like people uh, accuse it of, um, our thalamus is really sketchy. So it's it's doing barely anything. It's passing on this. It's it's rhythmically activated by these brainstem structures, but it's passing on very little. Basically, these lines back from thalamus up to uh, anterior areas are just giving you a subset. And you think of it like this: the cortical inputs to striatum activate a certain population of medium finding neurons. Those are then funneled into the smaller pallidum, and th when those get passed up by the thalamus back to cortex, that's a very small set of, think of it, intersections of a bunch of the inputs that could have come in in the first place. And those intersections, what they're gonna do actually, since you're asking, is these are gonna cause short-term potentiation on the very, very apical dendrites of uh, uh, cortical neurons, which is where they project to, way, way high up in layer one. Um, these are not topographic. So, um, we do have some topographic ones, I'm not showing them. So yeah, a again, once I show you some of the activity, a lot of these questions are gonna become much clearer in a minute. Yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Besides for the direct and indirect pathways, oh, yeah. those seem to come I know, but it's really not, it doesn't mean that you- They absolutely aren't, yeah. And that's just a cartoon problem. Yeah, good point. No, and, and uh, uh, notice that the indirect at least goes to uh, GPE, right. which then goes to GPI, whereas the direct goes directly. Mm -hmm. But you're right, the, the, we have no hookups. You can see what a mess the cartoon is in the middle there. We just didn't see that work now. There are better illustrations, um, uh, nowhere near so cartoony, um, in the publication. Yeah. And where we're trying to take, it's the G2 is having a longer, like three G2 step versus two. And when G2 is occupied uh, in normal circumstances, G1, that is a much lower affinity. And, and so is that the... Yes, yes. So we're absolutely looking at the difference between the D1 and D2 receptors. Yeah. I, I, I think what I better do is show you. So the answer is the, all the standard things that you would think would come in a standard textbook about these things, that's exactly what we built in. Um, and then a bunch of stuff that is in you know the literature, not necessarily equally represented in every textbook. We've got a bunch of those, but there's an awful lot of stuff that we're also missing. So when I show you it running, so let me let me let me if I may, let me just skip over this. Yeah, and run to it now. Okay, so this this I think will be helpful. I'm going to show you a little map like this, and here's what it's going to look like: um, a, a cortical visual area, a cortical anterior area, see them, the visual anterior, um, and then uh, projections down from cortex to the striatal areas. Those then project to their respective uh, palatal areas. Those respect those project back to these different thalamic areas, which go all the way back to the anterior cortex. And uh, there's a SNC down here that is uh, being projected to and projecting back from uh, the uh, median spiny neurons. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to show you a little movie of watching this run in little in a few pieces. So first thing, input comes in. Okay, let me back up. Watch right over here. And you'll see inputs are coming in from this image. And they're activating certain cells. Um, uh, they're literally, you know, retinal cells.
those labeled lines. So they're giving you a spatial pattern of activity. And then uh, those project to, uh, in a much less topographic way, to the anterior cortical areas. Um, and you can see the initial medium spiny neuron responses. See them? Okay. Go on. Now you're going to see, okay, you see how they're, they keep on, go back, go on, see how they keep on responding. Um, and the uh, tonically active cholinergic neurons are paused now by the inputs from the uh, striosomes, the patch. Um, and there's an uptick, predictive uptick in dopamine activity. And again, this is exactly what you would see in any uh, Schultz paper on dopamine in the striatum. They're, this is doing the kind of thing that you see in the extensive literature on dopamine in striatal cells. Um, and that's a field uh, where, uh, what do you say, there's a lot of uh, uh, dispute about lots of things. And we do not adjudicate those disputes. Um, we don't settle them. We simply pick something that's well-published and well-cited and stick it in there and watch what it does. Then we take that out, stick in a different thing that's you know, cited enough um, and run it that way to see what that monkey does, what that simulation does. Then we take that out, et cetera. You see what I'm saying? So we're running this, it isn't a simulation, it's a family of simulations in which we can uh, uh, insert and remove uh, whoever your favorite uh, researcher's model of when dopamine is active and uh, uh, and what it looks like. So you can then adjudicate, which is what's good about modeling. We can so adjudicate. Are. Right, right. Do I need that strife in my life? <laughs> okay, I do not. Um, and I, uh, I don't really care what the striatal people say. You know why? Because there's a right answer. We don't know what the right answer is, but there's a right answer. This is one of the ways, just as Bill very generously, thank you, Bill, as Bill says, this is a way to approach this question, and that is exactly what we're trying to do. And on the other hand, sometimes things are multifactorial, and both ends can be right. It's exactly correct, and that's the I was the very next thing I was going to say. Thank you. Bill can give this talk. It turns out I don't I don't have to be here. Um, but um, but it, the the interactions among multiple areas while these things are going on causes all sorts of uh, uh, unexpected events. And so again, I'm, I'm gonna take you through, so it's a family of simulations. I'm just taking you through one of those just because it does a bunch of interesting stuff and the others also do, but I'm just gonna race through them if I may now. So, so the TANS are paused, the dopamine uptick. Um, now you get uh, uh, an actual reward because you've, you've um, activated, you've, you've, uh, the monkey's activated its uh, um, uh, button push. Um, here's the striatal action selection. You could see it, and this is laterally inhibiting these other striatal areas, and it's picking the button. And now you get a reward prediction from the dopamine. Finally, you get actually the measurement, the, the subtraction of those, the prediction error, and the stimulus is now off. See the stimulus? Off. But I'm going to go, go back again. Stimulus is going to turn off, but look at all this activity that still goes on. And in our hands, it's because of the uh, extensive feedback from uh, striatum back to, uh, to cortex and then feed forward from cortex back to striatum. And there's an ongoing cortical striatal loop that is giving you all the activity that you see in this little piece of the movie. See me? So it's a hypothesis, if you will, about uh, this form of working memory. Yes. Is there a bigger? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is. Um, so all of this is being driven. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you because um, I'm going to show you real physiological records in a moment. This was just meant to be a overview movie, uh, uh, you know, uh, flyover to so you could see it. Um, and the, the very next thing, now it gets the reward. Now it, um, it differentially uh, potentiates these uh, 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 striatal uh, synapses. And the, the potentiation is according to a standard Schultz-like -like rule out of the literature. Oh yeah, this is, so a lot of this has been built into a an extended uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, tool um, complete with uh, mandatory GUI. Um, and what it does is it allows you to build these things. I'm just going to quickly sweep through it. It builds, builds up these areas, hook them up, and then you can add and subtract to those. You can then pick some area, stick an electrode in it, watch the activity, etc. See what I'm saying, right? Okay. 
Uh, it's a, uh, it's a company that's that's partly Earl Miller, uh, partly uh, uh, Lillian uh, Mujica in uh, Stony Brook. Um, they're yeah, they're selling it. Um, but it, I mean, it's free for researchers. I think they're trying to sell it for uh, assistance in diagnostics. Um, everything's free at the moment. Um, and by the way, there's a e email me because I can send you to that site. You can play with that thing. Um, it's all it's released. It's up and running. Yeah. Uh, it, it's actually de novo. It's a, it, it was built in Julia uh, from scratch. Um, so it's it's not a simulation environment that you've seen before. Um, okay. Now, quickly to results. <laughs> I didn't leave myself any time. Uh, the uh, and so I shall. That's right. Okay, good. Um, very hard to get me to stop talking. Very hard. Um, so it learns. So all you're seeing here are just behaviors. Um, the over trials, you see the thing. This is this is the monkey. Actually, I forgot. This is the simulation, and it's showing similar kinds of ramping up in these uh, 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 learning over trials. It's it's getting the categories and it's getting them correct. But the interesting thing is, while it's doing that, it, the the only way that it's doing that is just by spiking. And we can look at the spikes. We can look at the local field potentials that come out of those spikes. We can look at uh, 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 interactions between areas um, uh, in and out of phase. Um, we can look at uh, the synapses and actually measure their strength. All the stuff we can do in the uh, simulation, which we so can't. The, so the, the simulation should randomly saccade at that. Um... That's right. So if it if it saccades, it could be, it could be saccading wrong, and it will then get a negative feedback, just like the animal does. And it will have to do, in this case, it'll do some funny LTP reversal thing. Right. So you get a dopamine, uh, 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 incorrect dopamine response. That feeds back to the striatal uh, synapses. That will send uh, a, a striatal thalamic message up to cortex, and you'll actually get uh, LTP reversal up in cortex. And there's a, it turns out there's a literature on this. This is the one we didn't expect, but when we built it, we found it um, on uh, the effects of dopamine on LTP reversal in anterior cortex. Can't make this stuff up. Um, I mean, I could, but I but I didn't. Um, so uh, right. So yes. Yeah, so so all that is again going on. Just when that dopamine uh, uh, is a downtick instead of an uptick, it will weaken those synapses and then send a message back. Yeah. Um, so physiological findings, I'm going to show you a few. Remember that the animal looks at this, then looks at the actual picture, then waits, and then has to saccade. So um, here is a the uh, uh, just the phase locking value between cortex and striatum, and it's it's getting this beta uh, uh, activity phase locking. Um, during the stimulus, here it is blue in the very early trials, and it gets even bigger, more phase locked, more synchronous um, in late trials. Um, uh, that's while the stimulus is on. When we stop the stimulus and the animal has to just hold it in working memory, um, you get an even bigger uh, uh, increase in that uh, uh, synchrony. See it? Here's the simulation. Uh, and again, the simulation does not have any of this data. It doesn't have any of this data. All it does is it tries to do carry out the same operations. And you can see that it's very messy. So for instance, it's got this big, big theta. Uh, uh, theta uh, you might, might almost be a low alpha um, um, activity. The animals are showing a little bit of that, but not much. And it's our job to try and understand why. So there's, I'm going to show you a series of these things where the simulation does some things that the animal does, some things that it doesn't, and trying to refine the simulation to understand what it is we're doing wrong, um, or what it is we're doing differently from the monkey, at least. Um, but remember, the simulation is learning during all this. So, okay, so it's, it does get this increased, slightly increased uh, uh, phase locking between cort cortex and striatum, um, uh, which gets bigger in late trials, and it gets even bigger during the delay periods. 
Uh, so a very related, if you will, kind of result. Clearly not exactly these curves, but there are aspects of them that, the, that are showing up in the simulation as it learns. I'll show you another one. Uh, oh, and just to remind you, so why is this? We can always ask, unlike in the monkey, we can't ask, how did that happen? But in the simulation, we always can. It's very simple in this case. This is simply a, a strengthening of the corticostriatal synapses. And so just cartoon, that's what's giving the increased uh, synchrony. Cortex fires, striatum fires. It's very it's something very simpler than you would have uh, than you might have imagined. Um, and by the way, that's all consistent. The dopamine only plays a direct role in that, yes, the dopamine is co-localized with the glutamatergic input from cortex to striatum. And so it, it strengthens the corticostriatal synapses. Yes, it's the modulator that strengthens the glutamatergic input. Yeah. Yes. Yep. And again, we have no explanation for that. Something gamma is going on, and we don't know what that is. Very, very good. Exactly right. And these are the things that we that we're looking at too. You're going to see several. I'm going to show you some more examples like this, and you'll see. Oh, I see. It's kind of doing the thing that the animal did, and then it's also doing this other thing. So let me show you one. Um, okay. Here's. Uh, Again, early is now black, later trials uh, are green. So by then, uh, so this is when he's struggling, when the, uh, the animal is struggling, this is after he's got it down. And what you can see is that, um, ah, sorry, I, I should, the, the, the introduction to this is that these are all during um, correct trials, only correct trials. I'm supposed to say it, I didn't. Now we look at correct and incorrect trials, and what you see is that um, in the early trials that there's a more synchrony between cortex and striatum uh, that then goes away and becomes much, much less synchrony once they've learned. These are in uh, uh, the difference between correct versus incorrect trials. That is when the, when the monkey or the model does pushes the right button versus pushes the wrong button. You see different phase locking in those two cases. Um, and by the way, that happens big time while the stimulus is on. It also happens here. Here it is when, the, when it, during the early trials. Here it is a little bit not significant though in the late trials. What do we see in the simulation? We see that lack of that that reduced synchrony in the uh, uh, later trials, just like here. We see it a little bit here again. We're seeing this funny theta thing that we don't have a, a good account of yet. We we do, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and uh, the uh, again, you're seeing this reduction in later trials, uh, just like is happening here, except here, it's not significant. It's not a big enough effect. Here it is. And we don't know why. Yes. That's it because it's a subtraction. It's a subtraction of correct versus incorrect. So that's that's what the y axis is is the subtraction of the phase the phase locking plv value phase locking value during correct trials minus the phase locking value during incorrect trials it's a funny hybrid notation all of this by the way all the empirical data came as i said straight out of earl miller's lab these are all his figures from his previous publications on this so that's the way he did it so that's what we mimicked uh, I'm going to show you one more. This one doesn't do, oh, oh well, why does this happen? The, the reason this happens is because um, the feedback is now giving you, oh, uh, uh, is giving you uh, uh, information that is supposed to strengthen the feedback both to striatum and to cortex. But notice that on the incorrect trials, the phase of these things is wrong. It's giving you the wrong signal because it's activating the wrong responding neurons. And that is what makes these two things out of phase. And again, I'm just cartooning it here to try and give you the intuition about what it is that's happening in this simulation. Is that happening in the animal? It's consistent with the metrics we have, with the measures we have, but we don't know if that's what's going on. That's what we're trying to find out. I'm gonna give you one more quick one of these. No, I'm gonna skip it. Um, I'm gonna quickly go on to a couple of discoveries. I'm gonna really try and race through these. So. 
first off, in the simulation, um, while the animal uh, uh, is uh, first seeing the image uh, for a few hundred milliseconds and then it's off, um, there's a big burst of activity. This is the simulation now. And uh, all we're seeing, remember, there's no local field potentials in the simulation. They're just spiking. How are we showing this field? Literally just doing a summation of the spikes and averaging them. Simplest thing, brain dead thing that you could think of. And yet, as we're going to see, it, it, it matches up with local field potentials in, in Earl's experiments very nicely. So we see this big uh, activity, then a drop off of activity, and then resumed activity. And we're like, well, what's doing that in the simulation? And it turns out it's because when the input comes in, you get all this excitatory activity that's also activating a bunch of uh, local inhibition. And that local inhibition is therefore very early on ramping up. And that is causing these excitatory responses to drop. So that's just the simulation. And it we now notice this funny thing and it's explained. Something very much like it on a slightly different time scale. It's a little bit slower. You can see that this one extends past 150 milliseconds, whereas this one only goes up to about 100 milliseconds. But something very much like it is going on, and we're now studying this in the animal to see the extent to which we've got it covered by this, or we've got parameters that are wrong, or if we're doing something completely different. That's one example. Here's the fun example. Um, take the cortical neuron spiking responses and sort them. Sort them by what? By which category the animal is going to respond, A versus B, and by whether he gets it right or doesn't. So here are those spiking cells. And all we do is we take them and we say, how much activity is there? And now look at the sort. The sort is um, category A and a correct trial, category B correct trial, category A incorrect trial, category B incorrect trial. See me? OK? That's all I've done. OK? In the simulated cortex. So we're like, that's unexpected. When is that occurring? That is occurring here in this, the first 200 milliseconds of cortical response. In other words, this thing, no, this cell knows that the animal has just seen a picture and is going to respond wrong to it. So we call that a bad idea neuron. And of course, then we looked in the monkey. Here's the empirical spiking data, and we sorted those, which nobody had ever done. This is Earl's data from, again, I want to say about seven years ago. Um, and we found that they sorted extraordinarily nicely into the same uh, categories of the combination, the intersection of which category and whether I got it right. In other words, these bad idea neurons are occurring in the monkey in the first 200 milliseconds. He's seen the picture, and he immediately knows which button he's going to push. And these cells know whether it's the right button or not. They're the same latency um, because we just got these things running physiologically. So they are, uh, it's, it, he's got a, he sees the input that both the monkey and the simulation see the input for uh, 600 milliseconds, then they're off for a thousand milliseconds where they have to wait, and then they can respond. Yeah. We're doing that. Yeah. Uh, it the same thing happens actually. Um, it's not the waiting for. Remember, this is all decided within the first 200 milliseconds of the uh, trial, before there's even a waiting period. Um, the Yes. Well, correct or incorrect. I mean, it would be, yeah, it will make the, the, the signal to response. That's right. Exactly. And again, this is, uh, it's not typically talked about this way in the macaques. Um, they, they're the, one of the reasons that they put in the waiting period the, the, is to look at working memory to see, you know, what's, what, you know, how, how is that encoding different? Uh, uh, from when you're actually looking at the stimulus. But the weird thing about the simulation is it's saying none of that is giving any new information to the monkey because it, it was already there. We don't know if this is correct, but we know that the simulation does it. And we know that when we look at the monkeys, those exact same signals are there in the first 200 milliseconds. 
So it looks like, you know, that's the kind of thing where I'm going to put it at the bottom. Unexpected encodings in cortical units, first in the simulation and then verified in uh, the monkeys. Yes. So that a model that... Um, but again, not because it knows anything about monkeys or anything about the task. Now the question is, is this not a robust funny thing to do? Like can you, for example, make a perfect monkey right? and go back and figure out why it's perfect? Yes. And you think that maybe the risk of training. Exactly what we're doing. So, okay. It's like everybody here could give my talk. All right, this, this is great. Um, yes, uh, that's exactly what we're doing now. Remember? I mentioned way too early on that, that we're interested in uh, diagnostics um, and uh, pharmacology. What could we do to the receptor types um, and even metabolic pathway inputs to the simulated cells to make them do better, do worse, get disrupted? That's what we're studying. Yeah, yeah we're, we're putting drugs into it, yeah. Um, so for instance, we're doing simple anesthetics, but we're also doing a bunch of other uh, uh, kinds of drugs that are you know, of clinical use. Uh, and we're looking at patient populations. So we're also making this model now in a bigger brain uh, to uh, match humans. And we can measure the humans both with EEG and with fMRI on completely different timescales. And we're showing what estimates the, th the, the, the sheer spiking model will do when all you can see is this filtered through uh, by, you know, an HRF of, a, of a, uh, uh, an F uh, fMRI. So, yeah, so exactly those questions. That's exactly why we built it. That's what we really want to go after. So at the moment, these are the, I mean, it's it was amusing enough to find out that we had this very early warning cortical encoding that that was discovered in the simulation and only later found in the, the monkeys that was worth telling a telling a tale that gives us some uh, confidence that we're on some kind of right path obviously we're not there yet but we, we we need ongoing tests of this kind to be able to bring it to the point where we can run the kinds of things that you're talking about exactly right so, yes so that neither the monkey nor the simulation is testing working memory Actually, it is because the so the simulation has to. No, I see. Good. Uh, I, I know what I said. It does have to hold that decision through working memory. There are no errors. It doesn't introduce new information into the working memory, which again shouldn't be necessarily surprising. You extend it to 10 seconds, it would begin to fall apart. Oh, yes. Yes, it would. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's, it's only. So it, it's what the working memory, so-called working memory, we're not even calling that, we're calling it holding memory just because it's a simulation thing. And we don't know if it's the same thing as what the monkey's doing, but the holding memory in the in the simulation is um, only uh, coming from uh, corticostriatal activity. There's no special neurons, there's no special channels. Um, so this is one of several very, very competing hypotheses about the nature of working memory in anterior cortex. And we don't know that this is correct. We know that it does what's needed in this experiment. But we're, again, same thing I said, it's a family of simulations. We're, we're reducing that uh, corticostriatal feedback. At the moment, when we reduce that corticostriatal feedback, everything goes away. So the simulation seems to be trying to tell us that we need that. But, but uh, I, I, we are keeping on working on trying to see if there could be funny kinds of channels of the kind that have been suggested specifically in the literature that could be uh, uh, in upstates for a long time uh, in anterior cortex, um, just to see if there's a way to make the biology of that actually also work in the, in the simulation. I don't have any results on that as yet. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be right to interact all the top down and bottom up. So is this like a family of models that can take that? The woman has had slip one, and we are coming to the question about the drugs. So, like, you know, the gene drivers, whatever, the special schizophrenia. So, is that, uh, you know, helping? Absolutely. None of which we've done yet. Um, we're slackers. What can I tell you? Um, we're just not there. But, but, but that's exactly the kind of question that we want to address is no, when the drug goes in, 
we don't know the mechanism of action. I mean, right? I mean, hello, pharmacology. We don't know the mechanism of action of almost anything. I, I know what they say. I know what the farmers say. I know what they're selling us, but they don't know. And again, this is hopefully a tool that could be helpful in that regard to see not only, you know, what is the, you know, size of an effect from a, from a particular, uh, uh, you know, compound, but where is it acting and what's the time scale of its activity? And again, we know enormous amount of the literature of what it's doing, and what it's not doing, but we don't know how that would affect these ongoing activities in these simulations. Exactly right. That's, that's really the thing that we're most excited about here. That's what, in a way, that's what all this is for. And the fact that we have got these little wins on the road to that is what's got us even more excited. So I'm just going to, that's it. I'm just going to give you take homes. Those, those are the take homes. Um, so let me stop. I'm only uh, two hours beyond my, uh, my limit. No, okay. Um, great. Uh, thank you very much. Well, we've already had a bunch of questions. The students can now be trainees rather uh with rick and ask more questions and uh, uh ask them how to succeed in business while trying really hard that's right there you go um and uh adam can you have those take them to Stephen? i think it's correct and you know there he is and then john can you pick them up to Stephen and take them to me Right. Okay. So, so, right. so okay. And then, and then I think.